negotiated with Iran to suspend its enrichment program and ultimately to dismantle it. It was called the Paris Agreement, negotiated in 2003 and 2004. Akmani Najad then runs for president in 2005 on a, on a platform that basically said the people who negotiated that agreement were traitors and ought to go to jail. And he wins, and he restarts the enrichment program. And we've been trying to get back to the Paris Agreement um, ever since with no avail. There were ongoing negotiations that seemed to be supported by the Supreme Leader, and every time they seemed to make progress with Ali Larijani, who was the negotiator, Akmani Najad would give a public speech about how the people that were in, how Larijani was a traitor, and it would all fall apart. Now it appears, actually, Akmani Najad may think it's in his interest to see if he could negotiate a deal, and it seems to be the Supreme Leader who is reluctant. The problem is the Supreme Leader is the one calling the shots, and he's increasingly supported, as I understand it, less by the old line clerics that made the revolution in 79, and more by a new generation of people who are heavily in the Quds Force and um, the, uh, the Guards Force that are in the security services. That's now his base of support. Uh, and there really is a question uh, whether he is now so dug on this issue, in on this issue, that he can give it up. Uh, I, I think the only way to test is to try to have the negotiations, but I think we should um, not ease off on the international pressure because I think that's the only reason they have come to negotiations, and I think that's the only way you'd actually get some kind of a deal acceptable to us if they really thought the regime was survival was at stake. But I'm, I'm pessimistic, but um, we'll see. Any thoughts on that? Uh, um, we'll take two more rounds. Uh, that's all we have time for. Please introduce yourself. So. Yes, thank you. Abdul Rahim Fakhrah from Jazeera Satellite Channel. Uh, good afternoon to the three of you. Mr. Hadley, you talked about the issue of trust or lack thereof. Uh, with the Iranians, and that reminded me of uh, uh, the former U.S. Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, when he was talking in his film, Fog of War, about <coughs> negotiations between Kennedy and Castro. He said that one way of making your negotiating position very effective is to actually empathize with the enemy. And in the case of the Iranians, the Iranians, as you're aware, they say that the U.S. toppled the Iranian democracy in the 50s, they uh, brought in the Shah, who turned out to be a brutal dictator. They supported another dictator later on, Saddam Hussein, uh, in his war against uh, uh, Iran. They invaded Iraq uh, soon after proclaiming Iran uh, uh, part of the axis of evil. Do you think that empathy in this case is a good thing, or do you think that it will be playing with fire? And I'm tempted to put one quick one to uh, Dr. Brzezinski about Israel and uh, Egypt. If you could rewind back to the dynamics of negotiating between the Egyptians and the Israelis in the 70s uh, uh, at Camp David, do you feel that, given the current debate in Egypt about democracy and democratic mandate, if you had two democratically elected leaders at that time, do you, do you, do you think you would still have been able to conclude the peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians? Thank you. Probably not, <laughs> actually because public emotions would have complicated the political process. And so it took very assertive leaders on both sides to strike the deal. Yeah. Now, on the empathy business, you know, you have a point. I think the fact of the matter is that the experience of the Iranians in the 20th century with the West wasn't all that pleasant for them. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is they were, in some respects, victims to both British and Russian imperialism. And then we played a dominant role in a manner which, unfortunately, over time, alienated a good proportion of the politically active Iranian public. Um, this is not a case to justify what then followed. Uh, I remember I was engaged in a big debate within the US government at the time how to react to the challenge within Iran that was being posed by, both by the Tudor party, the communists, and by how many? And my answer was, maybe right, maybe wrong, we never tried it. Let them impose martial law, crush them, 
and then undertake broad reforms and concessions. But in a revolutionary situation, you don't do it the other way around. Well, that wasn't tried. But those who argued with me in the administration made the argument explicitly that Khomeini is the Gandhi of Iran, something which I don't think has been borne out by facts subsequently. So that we were in a kind of, we were locked on the horns of a dilemma. I don't have much to add to that. I mean, you can understand their narrative. The question is, where do you go with that when they're still supporting terror, you still worry about them going for a nuclear weapon, and they're threatening the state of Israel? Israel. So, you know, you got to you got to try to understand that. Our negotiators have to understand it. It can, it can help, but it cannot excuse behavior or allow you to give a pass to behavior that fundamentally threatens our interests. And that's then the conversation. Um, uh, I'm going to take just w the last two questions because we, you know, uh, Dr. Brzezinski's time is uh, tight and uh, we're, we're going to have to make do with that. Please, okay. one from this side, <clears throat> one from this side. Yes, uh, my name is Sam Mutamedi. I'm a second year uh, government and politics and uh, Persian studies major. And I was hoping to get your opinions on whether, how optimistic you are of regime change in Iran within the next 10 years. and how an American or Israeli attack on Iran would affect the possibility of uh, Iranians rising up given the strong sense of nationalism that, is, as you said, existed for 3,000 years in the country. And uh, Saeed. Yes. Uh, my name is Saeed Arikat. Uh, Mr. Hadley suggested that for the next uh, one or two years, there will be no movement by the administration on the Palestinian-Israeli issue. Uh, and you suggested that perhaps you can preserve the status. What should the United States do to both of you, as a matter of fact, what should the United States do to maintain a simple enough status where an outcome of a two-state solution is possible? And second, do you believe that this heightened rhetoric on war with Iran, this talk of war uh, with Iran, is giving, uh, actually giving uh, Mr. Netanyahu a free pass on the settlement on Lambie's process? Thank you. Uh, the final. <laughs> there are several yeah. questions, different questions. Uh, whatever you like to answer. Take your pick. You pick some, and I'll take yeah. the rest. Right. <laughs> well, there was a question which pertains to the Israeli-Palestinian process. Right, right. And my concern about it slipping in time is that it is not a static arrangement. You know, you can have a little more economic and quasi-political freedom in the West Bank, and you can upgrade the level of uh, the Palestinian condition. But something else is happening at the same time. And what is it? This construction of settlements. When the peace process started back in the early 70s, there were 6,000, 8,000 Israeli settlers in the West Bank. They're now close to 500,000. Uh, that becomes increasingly difficult to deal with. So the longer there is no progress on the peace, the greater difficulties then in achieving peace, that is the real compromise. Uh, two, two thoughts. One. Um Prime Minister Netanyahu is focused on Iran because he believes it's an existential threat to Israel, and you can understand that. Um, there is an issue with settlements, as Dr. Rajinshi described. I think the Bush administration actually had a solution for that that regrettably did not get adopted by the President Obama's administration. There is another issue, and I am very supportive of the Palestinians, and I'm very supportive of what they have done on the West Bank. But you know, there is an issue about whether any Palestinian leader can actually accept a peace agreement. There have been a, some very good offers made to Chairman Arafat, very good offers uh, made to President Abbas, and both said no. So if you're an Israeli, you're saying, well, you know, is any Palestinian able to accept a peace arrangement that is a compromise or is the only peace that a Palestinian leader can accept something that's 120 percent of their opening position? It's, there, there is a lot, there is a lack of trust in a negotiating process on both sides and there are reasons for that, the ones Dr. Brzezinski talked about, the one I tried to suggest, and they are an overhang and a burden on negotiations. In terms of Iran, you know, I'm, I'm a freedom guy, I admit, but I just think the Iranians are a great people, they are a talented people, 
and the idea that they are going to accept what the current regime offers when the region is crying out for more freedom and democracy and actually people are taking responsibility um, for their own freedom. I just think at some point freedom is going to come to Iran, but it's going to be hard. This regime is very dug in. Uh, you've got the Revolutionary Guard, you've got Kids, Quds Force, you've got the, the Baijis. I mean, it is. it will be very difficult, and I worry that it will be very bloody. And I think one of the downsides, as Dr. Brzezinski would say, of a conventional invasion of, of Iran is it will cause people to rally around the regime, rather than to say the regime wrought this upon us by their foolish policies, which I think was the truth. People are nationalistic. And regrettably, I think in the short run, it would cause people to rally around the regime. Whether at some point people would say, you know, this has not worked out so well. Maybe the problem is with that regime. I would hope so. Um, so I remain optimistic, but um, it, it's, it will be a real challenge for the Iranian people when that day comes. Well, I want to uh, just, uh, before I thank my, my colleagues, uh, I want to announce another important uh, conference tomorrow uh, sponsored by the Gildenhorn Institute here on campus in the Stamp Student Union at 8.45 in the morning about the political role of the militaries in the Middle East talking about something relevant. There's a conference half a day at the Stamp Student Union uh, tomorrow morning at 8.45. Uh, I think when Mrs. Sadat uh, spoke and introduced our panelists, she promised you an intellectual treat. And I think we've had an intellectual treat from two extraordinary experts on American foreign policy. You've both honored us. Thank you for coming to the University of Maryland. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Thank you.